Uh, I'd like to introduce Heiko Guerin. Heiko is uh, the head of technology for ThoughtWorks in Australia, and uh, he, I know, I've learned a lot about making engineering organizations more effective from Heiko, and joining Heiko will be Michelle Lowe. Uh, it says here she's a senior software engineer at ThoughtWorks. That doesn't really describe everything about Michelle. She is, among other things, a lawyer, so, uh, and, and she, but she likes coding, so who knew? Uh, and she's good at it, too, very good. Uh, so, with that, I would like to answer, I'd like to introduce Heiko and Michelle. Hello. First question is, does this work or not? It does, excellent. Um, hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> so, um, maybe we talk a little bit about like, ourselves and why, why, they, why we think we have to, something to say about engineering effectiveness. So, maybe you start, Michelle. Thanks, Heiko. Hi, I'm Michelle Lowe. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm a senior software engineer at ThoughtWorks. So I started at ThoughtWorks a number of years ago as a grad. Um, prior to working at ThoughtWorks, I worked at a big four accounting firm for a number of years in risk management and tax. So I've seen effective teams from a tech and non-tech perspective. Um, through my time at ThoughtWorks, I've had the pleasure of working in high-performing engineering teams, as well as dysfunctional ones. And that has led me to wonder, what's the difference? How do they end up so different? So I've been trying to understand more about that, why they're different, and what can be done to improve them. And more specifically, what can I do to make it better? So that's why I'm here, yeah. Ico. And I'm here because <laughs> I've been delivering software for probably 17 or 18 years now. I've spent a couple of years as head of engineering for Australia. So I've, I have seen like a large number of teams hopefully be effective and some not effective. So that I feel that entitles me to at least an opinion of what made those teams more or less effective. So that's why I'm here. Um, <laughs> Excellent. So let's talk about engineering effectiveness and get some terminology out of the way. That, that's uh, always really important. Um, it feels like in the last 18 months, like there's been a bit of an explosion of people caring about making their organizations a little bit more effective. Some people talk about developer productivity, uh, some people talk about developer efficacy, but I can't pronounce that, so we're calling it engineering effectiveness, uh, at least as for the purposes of this talk. Um, so I'll start with one definition, um, and that definition is um, measuring and improving the value and impact of engineering through targeted investments. I have actually stolen that, I think, from Scott, who introduced us earlier on today. Uh, but So it is developer productivity, and it's about talking about the ways to improve the value to the business, to the clients, but also to the people that are delivering the software. And when I say the people, I don't, don't just mean developers. Development teams and engineering teams are made up of a whole bunch of different roles uh, that are all making it effective. Would it be whether it's like BAs, QAs, project managers, technical program managers, everyone. Um, so we're deliberately also not calling it productivity. I think that is quite important. We're going to get back to why and why that is a loaded term a little bit later. But in a nutshell, productivity is almost always outside of our control. It's really, really hard to measure. We'll talk about that in a little bit, though. So why do we care and why do we care now? Like, this slide here talk, has a lot of information on it, but um, as I mentioned before, in the last 18 months, it feels like it's been a bit of a, bit of a golden age. If you really care about engineering effectiveness, then uh, starting from 2017, 2018, a lot of research, a lot of books have been written and have come out, and some of them are on the, on the left-hand side uh, behind me, like the Dora Institute, for example, you may have heard of them before. Um, and there's also de dedicated productivity, they're calling it productivity groups at Google and at other organizations, but there's been a lot of a lot of people that have cared a lot about this. And even just this and last week, uh, studies have come out with like McKinsey publishing a piece just last week talking about the ability, their ability to measure individual, developer, uh, individual developers' productivity, which is quite interesting. Uh, but what is really hard is to measure how engineering organizations are effective and what the impact of that effectiveness is. Um, so we've tried to quantify that on the right-hand side a little bit. Uh, um, so some of it is, is cost-related, as always. Um, and that also speaks to one of the things that were in the title of this talk, and that is uh, managing waste. And like from uh, studies from 2017 and 2018 and all the way up to 2023, we estimated about 30 to 40 percent of all the activities that engineering teams do and undertake to deliver software are actually waste. 
when we say waste, we mean wait times, waiting for approvals, handoffs, um, and the bottlenecks, that kind of thing. And if we conservatively assume we could save 20% of that waste, that would translate to a massive improvement. So if, if you've got an engineering organization of, say, 200 developers, if you saved two hours for each developer, uh, or each member of the engineering team a week, that would add up to about 10 full-time members of an engineering team in terms of annual salary uh, that could, could be adding value instead, um, which is quite significant. There's also a bit about talent uh, retention and talent acquisition. So people sometimes pride themselves into hiring the, the bright, best and the brightest from, um, from product companies and from tech companies, but if they don't actually have a productive environment to work in, they will leave again, and that uh, manifests itself not only in salary cost that is lost, but also things that are not as easy to measure, like you know erosion of culture and uh, other things in terms of being able to have consistency in, engi in engineering practices, for example. Uh, the third thing is about um, competitiveness and time, time to value, and uh, a lot of um, emphasis has been placed in the industry on the research of the DORA Research Institute that talks about stability and throughput and like measuring uh, organizations on that. That is that. Uh, so if you want to quantify it, like more nimble organizations move about 10 times faster than less nimble organizations, which is quite significant. And the last one is about predictability. Um, it's just that your ability to follow a plan. Um, boards love that one, you know, two to three year plans, being more predictable, that's all great. Um, so that's why, why we care. Um, but getting back to this whole thing about productivity. So productivity measures the total economic benefit returned by like a given unit of effort. So it's influenced like by how well a product does. Uh, and that, that means that you know, there's a whole bunch of things outside of your control that influence productivity. So it's really hard to measure it directly. Uh, there's a lot of variability in business, and it's a business question. It's not really an engineering question. But if you were to ask instead, like, what if, what if you want to improve the impact the engineering teams have on an organization and you only have a fixed amount of money to invest, then what's going to be most effective? And then, then uh, that's a better question to ask. Um, there's also one thing that will come up a little bit later again as well, and that is uh, productivity itself sometimes devolves into measuring individual productivity, which can be fairly counterproductive, and we'll talk about that later on. So um, uh, one thing that we have learned, um, while doing work with many organizations is that, that this myth of a 10-time developer, they, they may exist, but if there is a 10-times team, they, may be, they will be those 10-times developer any day. So, what makes engineering effective or not? So there's two quotes and there's two aspects to that I'm gonna talk about. The first one is by Nicole Forsgren. Um, she's been publishing research on effectiveness for the last I don't know, five, six years, and I've been following her work ever since. Um, and th th the first thing is that um, it's probably not that intuitive, and that is about uh, in removing friction and living, making engineering teams' lives easier and increasing joy and decreasing frustra frustration. So that might not be the most, uh, the most intuitive thing that you think of, but it's actually really important. Um, it has a direct, uh, how people feel when doing their day-to-day -day work has a direct impact on how productive they feel and how effective they are as engineering teams. Um, the second thing uh, to, to think about is, this is a quote by uh, William Deming, um, the system that people work in and interactions with people may account to 90 to 95% of performance. So a bad system will always uh, beat a good person, um, which is quite important because um, it, it brings us to this next idea of like just um, improving your, in, in your patch and in your team and, and as an indi individual has limits. So you can only go that far when it comes to that. That's why we are <laughs> optimizing the system, <laughs> which is a fairly, fairly ironic slide to get wrong. Uh, but we're talking about different uh, spheres of influence. So you can, as an individual contributor or on a team level, optimize any day, and you can you know, improve your engineering practices, and you can like, optimize for throughputs, and you can measure individual productivity, but there's always going to be something that is outside of your control. It's on the organizational level, or it would be on the department level. So we're talking about spheres of influence uh, here, and um, we need to optimize the entirety of the system. And Michelle um, will probably talk about the first two bits. Hang on. Change the slide. So we're going to start with the individual engineer because they're at the center of it all. You might have a really good product with really great profit margins, but if your engineering team is ineffective 
or if they're not in an environment that sets them up for success, the business isn't going to do very well, especially not in the long term. So it's in everyone's best interest to make things better for the individual engineer. If they can do their job well, everyone will do well. So if you're in senior leadership, it should be one of your jobs to make individual engineers effective. And that's not by yelling at them or telling them to do better. It's by creating an environment for them to succeed. So to give you an idea of what we want, it's probably easier to tell you what we don't want. So these are symptoms of ineffective engineering teams. They might be familiar to you. I know I've definitely worked on teams that show these kind of symptoms. So high staff turnover, absenteeism, um, a lot of bugs being reported by customers, low, uh, sorry, slow onboarding process. So these are an idea of things that we don't want. So starting with the individual engineer, what effectiveness looks like depends on where you're at in your career or where you're at on the team. So if you're a new starter or you're new to the code base or the tech stack, being effective is, well, at that point in time, you probably don't know very much, and that's okay. It's not your job to know a lot. It's your job to be curious and to be encouraged to ask questions and to increase your knowledge. Your team should be encouraging of that. You should be given sufficient time for onboarding and the right tools and processes to ensure a smooth onboarding process. And be proactive about it. Don't expect the knowledge to fall within your lap. But once you, sorry. Um, no. Sorry. But once you get to a point in the team where you are confident, you are relatively autonomous, what effectiveness looks like can be a number of things. Effectiveness can be achieved through continual improvement. So as I mentioned, it could be a number of things. You might want to spend some time with your code base, try to find opportunities to refactor it, make, improve the code quality. But I'd caution against doing that by yourself, behind anyone's back, over the weekend, that kind of thing. Don't be a hero. Treat it as an opportunity for your whole team to learn. Maybe the optimization that you're seeing isn't visible to other people. Maybe you could show them how to improve the code base and do better. And in the future, maybe they're the ones that will go and improve it for you, so then you can all work together in a better environment. Or maybe you have optimized your local dev experience and made it a little bit better than when you first started. And sure, you're a nice person, so if anyone asks you about it, you'll share it with them. But what if you could put it in documentation or make it part of onboarding, and then everyone can share the improvements that you've made? It's likely that the thing that you're finding annoying that you've fixed for yourself is something that other people are finding annoying too. And you can share the benefit with everyone. If you can do something that makes your life easier, consider sharing it. Or going one step further than that, think about platforms or accelerators that could be put in place to not only help you and your team, but also to help other teams. So maybe you have a deployment that takes days or weeks. What if you could do it at the press of a button? Think about all the time savings that you could have if you did that. And what could you do with that time? Maybe you could sit a, long, sit a little longer with problems, think more creatively about solutions, and really think about what value you can deliver to your customers. But speaking of measuring things, how do you measure individual productivity, which Hypo cautioned us against? Keystrokes, lines of code, code comments in PRs? Please don't do that. It's very stressful and counterproductive. I've worked in an organization that did that, and it was awful. It created an environment of anxiety, and it told me that you don't trust me to do my job. But also, we probably have different ideas of what my job is. There's an old business adage that of what gets measured gets done. And if you measure productivity in that way, or if you measure individual productivity like that, you're telling people that you want them to type a lot. And I mean, what could be more effective than an engineer that types a lot? You could get a lot of code. Will it be good? Probably will be bad, but there will be a lot of it. I wouldn't, sorry. sorry. 
Um, it's also a way of turning your teammates into competitors because it's in no one's best interest to actually work together to come up with a solution. You're treating each individual as someone who competes against each other. It's in my best interest to be better than Heiko. It's not in our best interest to work together. <laughs> so the things on the screen about continuous improvement that will help yourself and help the team, those things won't happen because it's in no one's best interest to do it. So when organizations measure productivity on an individual level, they're measuring for short-term outputs, as Heiko said, not, not future value-adding activities or outcomes for their businesses. So don't measure effectiveness in that way. I think the measures are more qualitative than that. It's a feeling, or as the young people say, it's a vibe. When you and the people around you can do your best work, you can feel it the things around you just flow. And when you're engaged and interested in your work, you care about it. But how do you create a space like that? That's where the team comes in. The team should be a safe environment where engineers can grow and improve. Sure, you want them to deliver new features and functionality without bugs, but how do you get there? No engineer is going to join your team knowing everything, and nor would you really want them to. For the engineering team to be effective, they need to work together to help each other and also feel comfortable asking for help. They should act like a team. Here, early feedback is important. And I'm not talking about feedback in the sense of how I can do better at my job, but yes, you should be doing that too. But I mean feedback that you don't understand what's being asked of you, or you've been trying to solve for something and you can't figure it out and you need help or feedback that you've been asked something which, you should, which isn't the best way of doing something, and maybe there's a better way, a more creative solution. People should feel free to speak up. If you can be vulnerable and trust that your team is going to support you when you do ask the dumb questions, you're going to be able to do your job better. But it's up to the team, particularly more senior people in the team, to create that environment. But how? If you're at the more senior level in the team, maybe a senior engineer or a team lead, lead by example. Admit when you don't understand things. Be vulnerable. When people ask you for help, encourage them to do it and treat them kindly. Maybe give them recommendations on different resources or things that they could read. Be kind to them. Be the kind of person that you would have wanted to support you. Another thing that can help teams run more smoothly is through having a shared expectation around how to do things. When things are predictable, people tend to feel safer. They know what to expect. At ThoughtWorks, we have a set of software dev sensible default practices, which we like to use on projects. Things like frequent and continuous integration, test-driven development, pair development. Are they the best way to build software? Depends on who you ask. Heiko and Scott might tell you yes. They're definitely a way of building software. But to me, the thing that makes them good isn't really in what they are, it's in what they represent and what they are at their core. It's about predictability. I could join any ThoughtWorks team, and I might not know the domain or the tech stack, but I understand how people work together. So I don't have to spend my time understanding how to get my code into prod, which different branches I need to test on to finally test something works a week later. I can spend my time working on what is different, what is unique about the problem at hand, and what value I can bring to the client. The sensible default practices share the theme of fast feedback, repeatability, and simplicity. The faster someone, sorry, how do you know if your team's performing effectively? Tell them quickly that they're wrong. The faster someone knows that they're on the wrong track, the quicker they can change their approach. Or if they're unsure about something, fast feedback can make them more confident in how they're proceeding, because they have some feedback that they are proceeding the right way. They don't have to act so cautiously. So that's why we pair program, frequently integrate, and get things into prod. These practices can lead to improved Dora metrics. Increase deployment frequency, decrease mean time to recovery, 
decreased lead time, sorry, decreased change failure rate. Things can happen quicker with less friction. But being effective isn't just about writing lots of code and getting it out, right? It's about doing things well and delivering something of value that people actually want. So share the customer feedback with your teams. Show them why it's valuable from a customer perspective. Bring the customer closer to your developers. If they can understand why they're building it and why it's valuable, they're able to do a better job. But what else can we do, Heiko? Yeah, what, what else could be valuable other than like just the individual and the team level? So this is where we <laughs> this is where we go up <laughs> in the spheres of influence, and uh, to talk about departments and organizations because you can only optimize your engineering practices so much, and you can only like build the most effective teams so much. But they they may be constrained by the system they're operating in. So we'll talk about those two levels next, and it's we're only gonna like spend about ten to twelve minutes on this. We're gonna cruise through it quite quickly. There's a lot of concepts here. We will explore a lot of them in the panel discussion afterwards as well. But let's talk about, um, again, symptoms of, of inefficient um, engineering on the department organizational level. As like, you know, teams that are doing too much or too little, that's what thrashing means. Engagement scores may not work out. There's things like bottlenecks. Uh, like if you've been following uh, lean uh, books and like all the, the agile movement, you've probably heard before that queues are probably the most evil thing that you could have, the, the, the biggest adversary we have in software delivery. Um, throughput, and that's change failure rates, and like things that manifest itself, lagging indicators. There's also poor diversity in some teams that we see, and when I talk about diversity, I don't mean it in like a political correctness sense, though that is true as well, but also diversity of thought and diversity of roles. So we sometimes see organizations that think they just need to put 10 developers together and they get the job done. We have made the opposite uh, We've had the opposite experience. So you need to have that diversity of role and thought when it comes to QAs, BAs, designers, product people, technical program manager. Um, and the last one is accountability. And sometimes we find organizations where individual teams are doing their very best to optimize for the product that they're delivering, but they're basically operating in a tragedy of commons uh, problem, so where like, they're all, all trying to do the same thing, but they're all optimizing in their little patch, and they're not looking at the system level, so that, that's another symptom. Uh, this is a very busy slide, but it talks about waste. Um, so this is a summary of like, all the different types of waste that, that we in ThoughtWorks and with our clients have observed that uh, occur when it comes to engineering teams, and almost all of these are caused by issues on the organizational or on the department level, so finding information, task switching, for example, the, what we call developer experience friction or how easy or hard it is to get productive on a, on a certain code base. Cognitive load, that is, that is one thing that will come up again and again if you're looking at the material when it comes to effectiveness. But just like, are people doing too much? Do teams have five or six or seven or eight different code bases that they need to look after? Probably in production as well. If, if they are, it's probably too much. Feedback loops, that's probably one of the biggest things that we could look at optimizing. So like how close teams are to their customers, for example. And the last one is operating model friction, like approvals, having to do rework. And we've tried to quantify, like from what we've seen at ThoughtWorks and what we know from uh, industry studies, like 30% uh, is probably like at most what, of what people do in terms of value-add delivery. The rest, the remaining 70% in most organizations are just spent in approvals, or as we like to call it at ThoughtWorks, faffing about, um, and we'd like to optimize that. So in terms of waste, this is what, this is what the price is, like those 70%. If you can re uh, reduce that, you'll be golden. So how do you optimize? We've broken it into two bits. Uh, we're talking about the department level first, and there's lots of terminology that you've probably seen before. The first one is coupling, like all how, um, how many teams are you dependent on to make a change on a system. There's a couple of different types of coupling. Some of them are more obvious, like architectural coupling. That's something you've heard of a lot if you've been reading like microservices uh, literature, but like, the ability to have cha teams make changes individually. But there's some that are not as obvious, and the first one is, is temporal coupling. So uh, a good symptom for that is if you've got like a whole bunch of teams that work on different services, but they install a like release train process to bundle their changes together, that is also a form of coupling that's quite uh, important. And the last one is backlog coupling, or like how many teams need to get approval from. So all these things are, are things to look out for. Product thinking uh, is a lot more important than you would think. I know we're talking about getting uh, delivery teams closer to their customers. Uh, 
but we, we have seen the, the best results in teams that have a direct line of sight of how their changes in, in codes affect their customers in production. And that's doubly true for uh, in internal platform teams, which we'll hear about a little bit later today. They also need to be treated as, an in, as, a, as a proper product, and uh, you need to apply product thinking and product management techniques to it. The third one is about team shapes and sizes. Sometimes we find teams that are way too large or way too small. Like, uh, there's a reason that we're talking about two pizza teams, and it's, it's based in cognitive research as well. So at ThoughtWorks and at our clients, we've found that the ideal size is about, it's about from four to about eight people. After that, it becomes uh, quite unwieldy. Cognitive loads is also quite important. How much are those teams doing? Are they just working on individual streams themselves or doing something else? And the last one is technical health. Um, like having an overall accountability for the assets that people are producing and not just doing individual product teams, and doing in, in, making changes on, the, on individual uh, streams of work. It's quite important to track and invest in technical health. So wh wh where do you start? This is probably a bit too small for you to see, but this is the secret weapon of uh, optimization. It's a value stream map. You may have seen this before. It's just capturing every single step on the way to get a product shipped from like a developer picking up a cars, uh, a card to shipping it to production. It's incredibly powerful, important. Like this is probably the one thing that I would recommend anyone do on their optimization journey when it comes to identifying bottlenecks. Um, on the organizational level, there's a couple of things that are also as important. And the first one is governance. We sometimes see like what we call um, either the department of no or no department when it comes to governments. Um, it's like either way too much or way too little. There's a couple of, of tricks that we've found that work quite well there, like using principles, for example, uh, or, or using defaults, as Michelle just mentioned, and instead of rules. And then there's, there's things like platforms to take off uh, some of the governance uh, characteristics as well. Culture, it's really hard to change your culture, obviously, but bringing your teams closer to their customers can have a tremendous impact on how they perceive themselves and how they perceive their productivity. It also applies to operations. One trick that works really well is to just use team goals and you set team goals instead of individual goals. And you give people the ability to make decisions as close as possible to, their, to the work they're doing. So one common example is give people the ability to pick the tools that they use to do their day-to-day -day jobs. Like that applies to things like IDEs that get mandated, for example. That, that leads to very low engagement scores for a reason. Funding, this is also a not obvious one, but uh, if you're just funding projects um, and not like a long-lived team, then the resulting architecture will ex look exactly like that. It will look like a whole bunch of people have made independent changes to a code base and nobody has thought about it on the whole. So the funding is quite important. And the, the second thing there is, Try to avoid like these large big bang business cases that take two to three years to complete uh, because they are probably wrong uh, and you can't ever, they're, always, they're never going to be on time and you can't measure how effective they've, been, effective they've been. The last one is organizational design. So the trick there is to identify how change flows through a system. There's a lot of literature on, on that, but the idea is that you pick a customer interaction and you identify what bits it touches in your organization and then you organize your teams around those flows of change. And it actually is a good idea to look at restructure. You know, restructure is a really sc scary word for a lot of people, but it's not a bad thing. If you're constant, consistently optimizing your organization for what is true in the here and now, that is not a bad thing at all. So what do you do? Um, capability mapping is a good one. Um, there's a couple of techniques you can use. Capability in terms of business capabilities, figure out what, it, what is actually there that needs to change and who changes it. Like in, in your organization, that could be a capability like reporting or booking, for, for example. Uh, one of the superpowers we have there is, um, this is event storming, it's one, one of the techniques that you can use. Uh, it comes out of domain-driven design. But the idea is to just identify those capabilities and how they map to teams and whether there are interdependencies in those teams. And the second, second uh, secret weapon on the organizational level is a bit of a cop-out, but it's just, you just do another value stream map, it's just bigger. <laughs> and so you, you do it from when somebody has an idea to it going into production, and you start to identify inefficiencies and bottlenecks on the organizational level. That brings us to probably the last thing, and like the thing that many people want to probably hear, and that is like, what do you actually go and measure? How do you measure effectiveness in teams or in individuals? Ideally not in individuals, but what, what is it that is, is a good thing to measure? Um, this quote is, is really great. It came out from research that comes uh, from Google. It's Kiara Jaspin and Colin Green. Software engineering is complex and creative. It's problem solving at its core. 
it is pretty much nothing like shoveling coal, and any attempt to treat it like that is probably going to miss the mark. And I think that is a really profound observation, because especially if you've been looking at lean manufacturing in software engineering, as so many of us do when we do, when we do Agile, I think we have been obsessing a bit too much over it, because we, as software development teams, we're not producing uniform things like steel frames, for example, that always look the same. Like, there's going to be variation in it. Yes, it is really important to focus on flow and have small batch sizes, but you can't really measure these things the same way that we're measuring like, the output of a manufacturing process. That's fundamentally the wrong way to go about it. So what, what can you do? This one is, is, is a good one. We've collected that together in ThoughtWorks globally. Like, what are good leading indicators of high performance? There's a couple of them. And the second thing that's probably also probably worth mentioning is that there's not going to be one measure or one metric that will tell you that you're being effective. Uh, so it's al almost always going to be a continuum of different measures and metrics. Here's a couple of them. Um, story flow efficiency, for example. We've got pull request mergers on there because we do acknowledge the existence of pull requests in the industry, though we only begrudgingly accept that they exist because we're not that big on pull requests. But this is really important. Um, it also contains things like getting information. When you look at uh, getting answers to internal information or technical queries. So that's leading indicators. There's lagging indicators. Uh, this is a framework that is by Nicole, Dr. Nicole Forsgren. I've had a quote uh, by her in the very early stages. This is how, actually, interestingly, how we, we used to measure, or we're still measuring, effectiveness in ThoughtWorks teams in ThoughtWorks Australia and New Zealand. And the idea is that, that performance is, or well, performance, engineering effectiveness is a continuum of many different measures on different levels on the individual and team and the system level. And you may, you may see that there, there's the, the door of four key metrics. They, they pop up there as well, but you need to augment them by other, uh, other measures as well because you could have a team continuously delivering an amazing product, but if the team, that is really, if the team is really unhappy doing it, it, it might not be worth it. And if nobody has asked for that amazing product in the first place, is it productive? No, it is not. Is it effective? Probably. So here's a couple of things to think about in terms of lagging indicators. So, let's maybe sum this whole thing up. So, individual productivity, don't measure it. Instead, focus on outputs and bringing customer value to your customers. Um, don't get distracted by individual productivity. Think about your team as teams and get them to work together to produce value for your customers. And remember that engineering organizations are complex systems. Don't focus on optimizing any specific part of your organization. Instead, look at the entire thing. If you can increase each part of your organization by just a small amount, the improvements will flow through the whole organization, and you will all benefit. So given that this is a journey, we figured it would be a good idea to maybe leave you to leave you with where to start that journey. So if you're an executive, if you happen to be in this, in this audience, I can see at least one, which is good. Um, you the best thing to start on is mapping your departments and teams to domains and figuring out if there are dependencies and bottlenecks and how could you, how could you like, look at your organizational design in terms of flow. If you're heading up a department, for example, and, like, so you've got multiple teams working on the same digital product together, value stream maps is where I would always start. Like, identify waste and start continuously improving. And so team leads, let your team know that it's okay to be wrong and to speak up if they don't understand things but also think about how your delivery and engineering practices can be improved. And if you don't know what they are, maybe that's a good place to start with your team. Be vulnerable with them, and maybe you can work on it together. And then for an individual, figure out where you want to go and work out what the first step is in, in achieving that. You could go so far as to tell other people what you want to achieve, but as with all of the um, groups in the slide, it's really about the first step. Thank you so much for listening to us. Are there any questions that we have maybe online or in, in the audience? You can shout them at us if you'd like. It's not, it's not on this. Oh. If not, that's fine as well. I like how this is how you could describe steak as well. Medium, progressive, and average. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. All right, thank you so much for listening. Thank hmm? you.
Oh. You can read one out to me if you'd like. We can't see them, by the way. Uh, with so many challenges in most organizations, how to prioritize where to get started? Um, I think we might have, might have answered. hopefully we've, we've done that in the, in the last slide. So individual contributors, start, start by looking at yourself, um, personal improvement plans. If you run a department or a larger organization, figure out where the bottlenecks are and value stream mapping is, is probably the, the core thing that you can do. Um, if you're a team lead, yes, being vulnerable and being the custodian of engineering practices is probably where I would recommend to start. Second question is, how do you manage the conversation when it just becomes a, play, a blame game of the developers uh, not writing enough code? I would like to understand how, how that even came up to begin with. I've worked with people who are in these environments, and I think part of it is talking to people one-on-one -on -one and understanding how it got there. Like, how did you get to a space where people didn't trust each other and it just became it a blame game. So I think trying to work on creating an environment where people can trust each other, maybe it's that people don't understand what developers do, and in which case I would probably recommend sitting with a developer if you're non-technical and seeing what they actually do. Maybe it is less straightforward and more creative than you expect. I know when I changed careers, I was surprised by that. Yes, an overemphasis sometimes on, on individual productivity. Uh, I once worked at a place where like, people were looked at when they stopped typing and somebody yelled at them uh, because the supervisor thought that they're not adding value if they're not typing. Um, a way to combat that if you're in a de delivery team is to just like, make your work visible, like show what you're working on and like, put it up, use, use visual systems if you can, just like give people the ability to see what you're working on and have keep it updated. That can go a long way, right? Uh, but it's still like, if, if you are running an organization, like changing a, the culture of a, that is ultimately controlling to, to one that is more generative is, is a really hard thing to do and it takes a long time. One, one way to go about it could be to just like siphon off like a, a, an individual team and start, let them start doing something in a new way and then having that spread organically through an organization. But a lot of, lot of a lot of words we could use to describe change management when it comes to that. But, um, but if you're in, a, in an organization like that where you get blamed, if you don't write enough I don't know, lines of code or if, if somebody counts your commits, for example, um, try to like, not just accept that. Try to actively do something about that and, and try to subvert it or like, talk to your engineering manager if there is one or talk to your team lead on how we could possibly change the emphasis on output to, uh, sorry, the emphasis on out, output to outcome. I think that is probably the first thing you can try to do. And then, I've got the, the questions here now. Uh, what can we infer from the hype and noise over engineers uh, losing roles to GPT core tools? Is the tension business versus IT going to be fatal one day? with free codes or low codes or, or no code? That's a good question. Do, do you think you're being made uh, redundant by a machine, Michelle? I don't think so because the organizations that I talked about that would measure individual productivity, I would probably not do very well in those organizations because I probably spend more time than I'd like to admit just thinking about problems. So in terms of actual output in writing code, maybe uh, code, what is it called? Um, the code, like the GPT. Ah, uh, uh, co-pilot. Yeah. yeah, like a co-pilot thing could actually make me faster, but I'm spending most of my time thinking anyway, so I don't think personally people are going to take, and um, the tools are going to take my job away because they're not at the level of being able to solve the problems in the way I solve them, but I think if you are a developer who is literally just banging out code, maybe you should think about doing a role that is maybe more creative and problem-solving based rather than just delivering units of code. Yeah, so I'm sure we're going to talk about that in the panel later on as well, but like chat GPT or Copilot or like large language model things, they are the evolution of our tools, right? I see it as that, and I don't see it as it being like a replacement of, of uh, people, what people are doing. And 
it, it, it also sometimes assumes wrongly that like the limiting factor in software delivery or, uh, is like how how quickly developers can type. Right? That is almost not, not that's almost never the limiting factor. It's almost always approvals, the process itself, having to go back and forth. It, there's almost always more to be gained from making systemic improvements than just looking at what individual people are doing with their tools as well. So. Um, is there a bit of a hype? I'm not sure if it's a hype. It's just we're in a downturn at the moment. People are optimizing for efficiency. People are optimizing for squeezing more value out of what they have. They're looking at you know doing doing more with less and all of that stuff. The, these things come in cycles, right? Um, we're just gonna go, just gonna wait it out. Is I think my my advice there. And you know if if somebody tells you that they can replace you with a machine or a low core tool or a no core tool. Get them to show you, because you might actually be. It might actually help you in your day-to-day -day work. So I wouldn't. I also wouldn't just run away from it, right? I would embrace it and, and work together to try and prove it out. If it actually can improve productivity, and if it does, awesome. Um, what else do we have? <laughs> Why is the popular image of engineers a lone ranger, author, typist, rather than editor, designer, team member? Is it a status thing? Or is it the history of the job? I'm not sure if it's the history, because like when it comes to developers, it's, it started fairly like non-male dominated um, back in the 60s. So like, I don't think it's like, necessarily like the really early history. I'm just assuming that, that these, these long range of trades are a bit more associated with, with, with non-male developers, of course. Right? Um, but uh, there's possibly something there. This whole myth of a, of a rock star developer um, that certainly does not help. Um, but again, like I don't, I don't think it's individuals. Like, like if you've got the, the the most brilliant developer on the planet and you put them in a team where they are, or in an organization where they're not allowed to make a change without 57 approval boards, they're not going to be effective. They're going to quit. So it's it's not individuals. Um, but yeah, like I. I I, I do agree that it might be might be a status thing for developers. There's also something there about hero mentality um, with, with some more senior developers, like just really wanting to be seen as the people that stay up all night and just push a chain through or spend, as Michelle said, spend the weekend coding and have refactored the entire code base without anyone like knowing about it and they come in on Monday. So that probably does not help. Not sure if that is like an answer to the question in and by itself, but. Um, is it a status thing? It definitely is a status thing in, in some places, but that comes back to culture. Like, how do you change the culture, and how do you like make things team goals and not individual goals? That would probably be the key thing I would do. The yeah, answer the one about literature. Hmm? Um, so someone's asked, as an IC who's looking to improve their own productivity, do you have any re literature recommendations as a good jumping-off point to get started with? Uh, I think for me, um, Refactoring by Martin Fowler was really good to look at and can he continue to go back to. Um, design Patterns, what else? TDD by Kent Beck. Yeah, all, all that is, is really good. And it's also like, just like looking at, I know I'm, it's gonna sound a bit like non developer -y, but like looking at Flow and like Flow and uh, is one of the, the the more important books in in software engineering and like how agile actually works and why why we're doing agile why we're doing short iterations that also goes a long way just understanding how systems interact and why we're doing the things we're doing them like at, at ThoughtWorks we pair program but it's like it's, it's important to understand what we're trying to achieve and what the impact of that practice for example is so going going a bit outside and looking at some more systems thinking f stuff to read goes a long way as well. Yeah, but I think there's also a lot about actually having the hands-on experience. Um, I know I'm very guilty of buying a book, reading a book, and be like, oh, yeah, I can do this. And then you actually get to having to change something. You're like, oh, I actually don't know how to do this. So I recommend um, understand the theory, but also getting the hands-on experience if you can. Um, how do you balance engineering with delivery business needs? Best practices don't always equate to delivering value. That, that is true. Um, it's one of the perpetual things that is that, that are intention really when you're doing like delivery. So it's like it's delivery, it's engineering excellence and building things the right way and building the thing the thing right and delivering functionality. Like there's always going to be a debate, right? The key thing is that 
at the voice that talks about technical excellence is not completely uh, silent. Because then if you're just optimizing for feature delivery, technical debt is going to mount. Things are going to fall apart in five to six years' time. Things are going to erode. So you need to maintain software as an asset, like the way that you maintain a garden, for example. So getting that explained to executives and, and organizations is, is one of the more important things that you can do. Yes, you can do stuff like total cost of ownership, for example, or you can um, try quantify like what, uh, what the measures of, of flow, or like um, if you've got things that where the, your ability to measure whether something has been successful or whether you, if you make a change that there's a direct impact on the bottom line, you, you can do that, for example. Um, but the, the key difference is that it's ultimately creative work. It's, it is, uh, it's not uniform, as I've mentioned before. It is, it is not just producing a steel frame or a, a car part, for example. It is creative thinking work. That is, that is the core difference. And by, in and by itself, it's not manufacturing. It's, it's design. It's a design process. And you have to iterate over that. That, that is the main difference to me. And I think we're at time for that. Thank you so much again. Thank Thanks for you. all the questions.